I guess, once you start doubting, there's no end to it. Our imaginations are often capable of consuming us entirely. It is thanks to doubt that we slip into an abyss of thoughts that would only pull us downward, into the ceaseless depths of suspicion. And this happens especially when it comes to our own identity. In the Ghost in the Shell franchise, Major Motoko Kusanagi faces a similar crisis of faith when she happens to question her own existence and the purpose of her own life. However, her partner and friend Bato thinks otherwise. In fact, the white-haired, cyber-eyed man is the polar opposite of what Kusanagi stands for. While the Major is tormented by existentialism, Bato appears to be doing better for his own self and the people around him. In our previous video on Major Kusanagi, we discussed at length how her fusion with the Puppet Master was a byproduct of her own existential dread, because she couldn't find any purpose for her actions as a leader of Section 9. On the other hand, we have a more optimistic Bato, who looks out for friends, come what may. So, in this video, we'll delve into the character traits of the most prominent supporting character in the Ghost in the Shell franchise. As we encompass the 1995 film and its 2004 sequel titled Ghost in the Shell Innocence, we will further explore Bato's anatomy, which plays a fundamental role in both films. The Major's Trusted Point Man and Closest Friend Bato in Ghost in the Shell, 1995 the 1995 Ghost in the Shell film was dedicated to Major Kusanagi's self-discovery to a great extent. Bato's presence in the story only seems to exist to show the contrast between the Major and her partner. But before we examine that, let's have a look at the white-haired cyborg himself. In the 1995 film, Bato has white crew-cut hair with a tall and stout physique that is clad in army-issue clothing. As far as his anatomy is concerned, Bato has prosthetic limbs as well as a pair of cybernetic eyes that access the network to identify and analyze any subject before him, whether they are a civilian, are an assailant, alive, or deceased. While he leads the life of an ideal health freak with his hobbies being jogging and weightlifting, Bateau looks uncharacteristically old when compared with his other cyborg associates, such as the Major herself. And speaking of the Major, Bateau is often seen running Point Man for Section 9. This is for two reasons in particular. One, Bateau is well versed in the art of close quarters combat, meaning he can take out his adversaries in near combat situations, thus making him an indispensable asset to Section 9. Secondly, Kusanagi has unfathomable faith in Bateau, and that is not merely for his skills. Bateau's emotional intelligence often outshines that of the other cyborgs that appear in the films. Whether it's pure rage or sarcasm, Bateau Bato's emotions constitute an important part of his personality, so let's see this under a microscope. As second in command to the Major, Bato in Ghost in the Shell is viewed as a no-nonsense special operative of the Public Security Section 9 team. However, his strict demeanor does accommodate his light-hearted humor, which is balanced out by his concern for Motoko's well-being. This is quite transparent in the boating scene of the film, where Kusanagi and Bato indulge in a philosophical discussion on how the consciousness will be restrained by external factors, even with the prevalence of cybernetic advancements. While the Major delved deeper into the questions of individuality and identity, Bateau continued with his pragmatic attitude, rebuking Kusanagi for spending too much time underwater and risking her cyborg body. Well, truth be told, Bateau's practicality is an offshoot of his genuine concern for his own colleagues particularly for Kusanagi. One can even interpret it as a way for him to express the base emotions, anger, shock, anxiety, and joy. Bateau's emotional intelligence hits the crescendo towards the end of the 1995 film adaptation when Kusanagi wants to have a conversation with the Puppet Master. Although he is overcome with the apprehension of losing Kusanagi to the snipers nearby, he holds his ground by her side and waits until the fusion is complete. This aspect of Bateau's personality gives a clear idea about his selfless nature when when it comes to protecting his teammates in the most dire of circumstances. However, Bato undergoes a psychological transformation in the next film, as he struggles hard to come to terms with Kusanagi's absence from the real, tangible world. At the same time, it is in the 2004 film that we come to learn more about Bato in detail, as the cyborg who took up the Major's mantle as the next leader of Section 9. He gets hacked and blows off his own arm, so he gets a replacement with a shotgun in it. Bateau in Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence While the 1995 Ghost in the Shell film was all about Major Kusanagi's existential dread, the 2004 sequel captures Bateau's occasional listlessness as he attempts to grapple with the ideas of loss and absence. Simultaneously, the events of Ghost in the Shell, Innocence occur from the perspective of our white-haired officer, quite literally. At the beginning of the film, we look at the city 
of Tokyo in a futuristic world from Bato's cybernetic eyes for the first time. His vision is characterized by a screen that features a yellowish mechanical type font, providing descriptive details regarding the various people and items he looks at. Through this narrow robotic perspective, we, the audience, are able to get a glimpse of the futuristic society in Japan, painting the landscape in the hues of nihilism while our stoic cybernetic hero continues with his pragmatic attitude in his life and work. But first, let's get a glimpse of what the sequel is all about. Ghost in the Shell, Innocence traces the murders of influential men in Japan by a series of ginoids that is, female humanoid robots, which eventually commit suicide after they do the deed. These robots are manufactured by Locus Solus, a prominent company in the cybernetic industry. Upon further investigation by the new leader of Section 9, Bato, and his new partner Togusa, the duo come to learn that Locus Solus has actually been involved in under-the-table activities to establish amicable relations with bureaucrats, other organizations, and members of organized crime. And the company has been doing so by trafficking the ghosts of young human girls from the black market and incorporating them into the shells of these ginoids to sell them as sex robots. Thus, Bato and Togusa attempt to unmask the shady actions of Locus Solus that affected not only human beings, but also thousands of robots that were brought to life via ghost dubbing, an illegal procedure of transferring human consciousness into a cyborg as the latter's ghost. So, how does this all affect our white-haired leader of Section 9? Let's find out. Over the course of the sequel, Bato undergoes several changes in terms of his appearance as well as his own psyche. Speaking of his anatomy, there are two major incidents that take place in Ghost in the Shell Innocence. The first happens inside a convenience store where Bato's cyber brain is hacked and his right arm is blown off. Via his distorted cybernetic eyes, the viewers are able to experience Bato's confusion and anxiety as he fires shots at civilians while he's under the impression that the unknown assailant is near. This is followed by Bato getting a prosthetic right arm that can dismantle itself to reveal an advanced shotgun for close combat, an effective weapon for a man who thrives on close encounters. At the same time, Ishikawa, one of Bato's associates, reveals that he was hacked by an entity and manipulated to shoot his own arm off. This means there was never an assailant in the first place. In addition to this, Ishikawa reported that this may have been an attempt by Locus Solus to frame Bato in a cybernetic scandal, since prior to the convenience store incident, he and Togusa had barged into the Yakuza office to investigate their relations with the serial murderer. So, the fact that Bato's cyberbrain is near impregnable and could only be hacked by a handful of individuals across Japan gave the Section 9 leader a major lead to track down Kim, a notorious cyber hacker who may have close ties with Locus Solus. And it is during this exchange between Kim and Bateau that we witness the second important development in the latter's anatomy, being hacked for the second time. But before that, we really have to talk about the phenomenal philosophy of perfecting human life that Kim elaborates on in the sequel. Kim's mansion, situated in the erstwhile Itorofu Special Economic Zone, manifests one of the most important themes of Ghost in the Shell Innocence. One can attain perfection only if a being has infinite consciousness, like a god, or no consciousness at all, like a doll. Well, in his doll-like shell, Kim states time and again that humankind is a flawed system that lingers in the semi-conscious arena where they can never go beyond their true selves. The human's egocentric perspective only tends to hamper their path to becoming the perfect being, one that is independent of its own restraints. Quite frankly, it's ironic for Kim to speak highly about gaining infinite consciousness or abandoning it all to become perfect especially when his human brain is still alive, that too within the shell of a doll. Well, this irony is what lays the premise of the harrowing virtual maze that Bateau and Togusa would later be captured in. So, Bateau was hacked for the second time at Kim's mansion, and it happens in the most thrilling yet terrifying way possible. As Bateau and Togusa walk to the mansion from the iconic Homo ex machina statue, the duo is welcomed by the sight of a young ginoid accompanied by a dog, with the following letters arranged before her. A maze. When both the men finally get to meet Kim in the doll of an aged, crippled humanoid, the latter elaborates on his obsession with perfection. In the meantime, Togusa goes through Kim's bookshelf, only to accidentally draw a book out to reveal a safe with a miniature model of the mansion. As Togusa peers through a hole in the model, the viewers appear to be sucked into the dark abyss, only for us to suddenly be back at the statue of the Homo ex machina with Bato and Togusa having the same conversation on Kim's origins 
before stepping into the building. The chain of events remains the same except for two things. One, the letters in front of the young Gynoid change in their second visit, with only the letters M-A-E-T-H present. Secondly, Kim seems to have possessed a new doll this time, one that is made in Togusa's likeness. Just when Togusa is about to gun down his version of the doll, he notices a change in Bato's neck movement, similar to that of a marionette. In an instant, Bato's facial coverings open up automatically, revealing his mechanical skeletal structure with a pair of blue cybernetic eyes. Togusa is overwhelmed by the sheer horror of the entire scene, and that is when the viewers are once again brought back to the statue of the Homo ex machina as Bato and Togusa once again have the same conversation. This time, however, Bato is able to discern that Kim is the one hacking into their cyber brains and playing a virtual maze over and over again until their mental faculties gave up entirely. As he subdues Kim, Bato also resets Togusa's cyber brain, which is still in a daze after having experienced so many strong emotions within a short moment. Guess you could say third time's the charm. However, one of the biggest reveals in Ghost in the Shell Innocence was Bateau using the shotgun that had been integrated into his right arm. At the same time, he was accompanied by a stray gynoid that was being remotely controlled by Kusanagi, to whom he keeps referring to as his guardian angel throughout the film. After all, it was Kusanagi's voice that had first warned Bateau of the convenience store becoming a kill zone right before it turned into one. Hence, it can be inferred that Bateau isn't the only one looking out for his pals. Even after she became an entity with a semi infinite consciousness and was deemed rogue by the police, Kusanagi never abandoned her friend and colleague especially when he was ambushed by an army of deadly gynoids within the Locus Solus facility. Kusanagi and Bateau share an unconventional bond as friends. They're aware of each other's differences in opinion as far as their respective philosophies are concerned. Even then, the two cyborgs protect one another at all costs, with the same goal in mind, to protect the innocent from the corrupt. The biggest difference between Source Bato and Adapted Bato isn't anatomy, it's attitude. How Mamoru Oshi changed Section 9's funny man to fit his narrative. Eyes are the windows to one's soul, but that can't be said in the case of Bato, since his eyes don't look like that of a human being. The robotic implants don't even have a visible iris or pupil. It just seems like a pair of white, opaque glasses that have been fitted onto his eye sockets. Although the initial impression is a bit unsettling, Bato's presence on screen eventually embodies a kind of warmth when pitted against the listless nature of Kusanagi in the 1995 film. However, the anime adapted version of Bato is in no way similar to the one we find in the manga. Let's first look at Bato's personality as depicted in the 1995 anime adaptations. Right from the outset, Bato's appearance immediately conveys the fact that he's not a human, courtesy of his cybernetic eyes. Unlike Kusanagi in Ghost in the Shell, his facial attributes, as well as physiological features, seem more inhuman than the protagonists. This is further emphasized by his stoic approach towards his work. Bato's tendency to let things be the way they are goes against Kusanagi's method of following instinct instead, be it human or cybernetic. After all, the Major's successes as a leader of Section 9 can be dedicated to her ability to make the swiftest decisions that would help her track down her adversary with ease. Yet, Kusanagi is unable to see through Bato's commitment towards physical fitness, especially because he's a cyborg and not a human who relies on food for sustenance. But this isn't the only human attribute in Bato. As far as combat is concerned, Bato usually opts for the defense. His ability to recognize his teammates as indispensable motivates him to take certain actions that could be defined as being human. This includes his tendency to wrap Kusanagi with a coat or any other clothing item, which is seen in both the 1995 and 2004 anime adaptations. Bato's caring attitude is complemented by his anxiety to protect his associates at all costs. Be it for Kusanagi in the first film, or Togusa in the second, Bato never hesitates to take a bullet for his friends, even if that means risking his own life. However, Ghost in the Shell Innocence witnesses a sudden change in Bato's personality. Bato changes from a light-hearted covert specialist to an unrecognizable cybernetic entity. Over the course of this video, we highlighted certain remarkable moments of Ghost in the Shell Innocence, during which Bato's anatomical and psychological changes are made apparent at every step. As far as his mental faculties are concerned, Bato's deafening silence during most parts of the film is a direct effect of Kusanagi's escape into the network, which happens towards the end of Ghost in the Shell. Having lost the physical presence of his close friend, Bato's way of coping with Kusanagi's absence is initially upsetting, resorting to silent treatments and speaking out only 
only if he wants to is quite unlike the Bato we see in the manga. In the monochromatic panels, the white-haired point man is depicted as being quite jolly, functioning as a sort of comic relief in the manga plot. The anime, however, witnesses a very strict and austere Bato, who would rather keep his thoughts to himself. In fact, his conversations with Ishikawa, as well as Togusa, are brief and equally somber. Yet, it was a surprise to see a rough and tough cyborg like him grin upon being welcomed by his pet dog Gabriel at his apartment. This tenderness in Bato is seen once again, albeit fleetingly, towards the end of the film, when he chooses to look back at Togusa's house as the latter happily gives his cheerful daughter a blonde-haired female doll as a gift. So, one thing is for certain, Bato may be a strict guy, but there is an enormous soft spot within him. And it is this attribute that makes him appear far more human than some of the cyborgs in Section 9. Marvelous Verdict The Ghost in the Shell franchise seems to be obsessed with the concepts of life, purpose, and memory. While cybernetic renderings constitute the basis of the storyline, the overarching philosophy of Ghost in the Shell speaks volumes about a contemporary society that is increasingly becoming dependent on electronic gadgets and artificial intelligence. And in the midst of this dwells a rift between Kusanagi's nihilism and Bateau's stoicism. While Kusanagi continued to question her identity and purpose in life till the very end of the 19. 95 Ghost in the Shell film, Bateau, the white-haired stoic, continues to stick to his guns, with the firm belief that Kusanagi's actions are dictated by her own conscience, the only humane attribute she has left. This does say a lot about Bateau himself. For a man who is supposed to follow his mind over his heart, Bateau's grit and conviction are as remarkable as his own anatomy. In short, by pitting Bateau against the philosophical perspective that Kusanagi represents throughout the Ghost in the Shell franchise, one thing is for certain. The differences in their beliefs is what makes both Bateau and Kusanagi more human than the other cyborgs in the storyline.